This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our fourth uh, COVID-19 conference call. Uh, I want to thank you for participating. Um, my name is, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Wayne Mitchell. I'm the president and CEO of the Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce. Um, I want you to know that we're recording this call and members of the media have been invited to participate as well. Um, I'd respectfully ask that uh, all of you put your phones and computers on mute until we're ready for the questions and answers. Uh, I do want to remind you that the Chamber has a wealth of information located at the Chamber's website, uh, www.nacodotus.org. Uh, please visit the COVID-19 resource page if you have time. At the same time, I want to let you know that we've had a bump of about 4,000 hits um, on our website. So it's good to see that so many of our members and the community members are, are using that site. And again, it's updated on a daily basis, but that's, uh, that's refreshing to have that many uh, uh, increases in, in hits on the website. Uh, I do want to let you folks know, in recent days, I've been asked about the availability of certain public officials and their lack of participation on this conference call. I want you all to know that we've communicated and invited them to join us. But I want you also to know at this time, it's very difficult for them to participate for a variety of reasons. But I will assure you that their comments are reflected very capably by their representatives on this call. Uh, we are uh, we're blessed to have some folks that are, are uh, engaged uh, in, intimately in this whole issue on the call, and I assure you that we're getting most of the questions answered here. Um, I also want to let you know that the Chamber office uh, hours will be 8.30 to 5 Monday through Thursday and 8.30 to 12.30 on Friday. Um, and um, I hope everybody can hear me well. <clears throat> But uh, I do want to let you folks uh, know that uh, uh, the feedback on these calls have been very positive and we appreciate your input and your suggestions for presenters. And we will continue to, uh, to seek the folks that you, you, you want to hear from. We'll begin with our first presenter who typically has gone last, but for no other reasons other than the fact that just the way the agenda was. But uh, I'm pleased to introduce one of my uh, colleagues here in town uh, Sherry Morgan, the executive director of the Nacogdoches Convention and Visitors Bureau. Sherry's uh, industry has certainly been impacted in a major way, and uh, we're anxious to hear uh, what she's hearing from her folks. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming together for this time for us to touch base with one another. Um, not much, if any, change in tourism. It's bleak. Uh, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, March, April, and May will be, for all intents and purposes, a total wash for tourism. But in this time, while we do take account and measure what we've lost and what we are losing, we can't just stop there. Now is the time for us to look for the opportunities that we have to affect change amid this crisis. Um, for the past year, short-term rentals operating within Nacogdoches city limits have been required to remit their local hotel occupancy tax, though only a fraction of those do so for whatever reason. We don't believe that it's through any ill intent. They're not trying to escape. They just don't know that they're supposed to because these are not lodging professionals that are opening hotel franchises. These are people that are opening up their rooms or their homes thinking that they're covering all their bases. The hosting platforms already take care of the remittance of their state hotel occupancy tax. So we're only looking at uh, those short-term rentals, Airbnbs, VRBOs, at home, things of that nature that are, low, that are operating within city limits. Um, across the nation, cities are struggling to find the fix to effectively monitor and enforce this local remittance. So just to give you, um, sort of a lay of the land of what that looks like for us here in Nacogdoches County. We currently have in the county 89 total active short-term rental listings across all of the hosting platforms. 79% of those are on Airbnb, which is probably the, the better known of all the platforms. 
these are experiencing 29% occupancy for the month of March. So right at the beginning of, of COVID-19, where our hotels are in single digit occupancy, these short-term rentals are seeing at least twice that. They're at you know 29%, almost 30% occupancy. Now, how that looks moving on for you know later March and April into those, that might change. But for right now, this is really hopeful for us. As it stands right now, this is money being left on the table for those uh, short-term rentals that are still operating within the city limits. Conservatively, about half of those, I would say, of that 89, most of those are in the county, um, which, of course, don't have to remit any local tax, um, hotel occupancy tax, rather. Uh, so we're going to focus here at the CVB on trying to wrap our head around what what that looks like, what that system looks like working with our finance department in the city to be able to um, monitor the situation because the reality of that is despite even if we were a metroplex because they're having they're having problems with this as well if we're Dallas in the time of just my report in this conference call we could have five new Airbnb listings so there is no way for us um, if it were easy, we'd already be doing it, right? Um, we need to figure out what that looks like for Nacogdoches to be able to capitalize on this opportunity and make sure that we are first and foremost leveling the playing field for all of our large lodging partners, whether they be a traditional B&B, a hotel, um, or an Airbnb. So that's one of the things, that's an opportunity that we're looking at. We've got time on our hands now to really think and make a positive effect a positive change on what our lodging landscape looks like here in Nacogdoches. We are also through our partnership with the Texas Forest Trail region. Um, they have offered us an online store uh, through which to sell some branded merchandise. Um, that should be up and operational by uh, this time next week. So please check it out and share that link. We'll have uh, T-shirts, polo shirts, poster prints, tote bags, a variety of things that um, hopefully can help us make up some revenue. In return, what they are asking is um, they are soliciting for this is my East Texas stories. Those stories that we all have that exemplify the extraordinary expressions of humanity and grace that we are living in right now that are specific and unique to Nacogdoches. And you can submit those stories and I'll put it in the chat section over, it's on the right hand side of my screen, um, but it's we are East Texas, all spelled out, dot com forward slash story. And if we could flood that site with um, those stories that we all have about our ancestors or our family or our children or just our neighbors that are really coming through and exemplifying what it means to be a true East Texan. That would be great. And uh, just closing up, my challenge to everybody this morning is think of three things that you as an individual, as a business, as an influencer, in whatever capacity you have to ensure that Nacogdoches is ready to receive visitors when the time comes. I've said it in past talks, um, in these weekly conversations, Direct travelers, uh, direct, direct traveler spending, on average in a year, brings anywhere from two to three million dollars into our local economy. Two to three million dollars—that's a lot. So when people can start traveling again, we want them to come back to Nacogdoches. We need to be ready for them. So what can you do to make sure the businesses that those visitors are going to want or need to frequent will be ready? Don't stop communicating. We're practicing physical distance. Just keep talking, just keep listening. Things like this, even casual conversations, what might seem insignificant or just status quo for you and your banker friends or you and your nonprofit friends might just be that one thing that sparks and ignites a great idea in one of your community partners. So please, just keep talking, keep sharing. And lastly, be the leader that you need in this time. Dig deep like our East Texas roots and stand tall like our towering pines around us. We are all suffering through this in one way or another. We're living through this. There will be an end to it. 
how we stand at the end though and move forward that's going to be the mark of what we know in Nacogdoches our true leaders can deliver so thank you thank you very much Sherry for those inspiring words does anybody have any questions for Sherry and again I remind you you can submit questions if you'd like by hitting the uh, on your computers the chat section on the upper right hand corner of your computer uh, as you're facing it and uh, and submitting your questions there. Well, thank you again, Sherry. Those are uh, uh, are very motivational remarks. Thank you very much. We're also pleased to have with us, uh, hopefully, Senator Robert Nichols and Representative Travis Clardy to give us uh, a state and regional update. Uh, Senator Nichols, uh, how are you? Uh I was very pleased I woke up still not dead again today. That's a Willie Nelson song. Um, probably the last week and a half, I spent more time working on medical hospital related uh, issues. Our hospitals were put onto non-elective uh, some time ago, uh, scheduled not to come off of them until I think April 21. The net result of that is our hospitals are not uh, loaded up with COVID patients. As a matter of fact, they're sitting on the idle, most of them. Uh, they're furloughing uh, employees and they're cutting back on hours. And in some of the hospitals, and I'm talking about in the region, not just in the Nacogdoches area. So it's really putting our hospitals uh, uh, in a bad shape. So the definition of an elected uh, uh, procedure uh, means different things to different people. The governor's order was very clear. Uh, he had two parts. First part was if it is elective, don't do it. I'm simplifying it. And the second part said if you have adequate capacity of beds and supplies for COVID patients, uh, ignore part one and, and do the surgeries. And speaking with a lot of the systems that are in the region and individual hospitals, uh, we've got patients that are not getting mastectomies. We've got patients that need tumors removed that are not getting removed. We've got uh, melanoma cancers that are being delayed uh, because you can set it for a different day. It's different than a heart attack, a broken bone coming in an emergency room. So the net result of that is it's costing our hospitals who are always struggling to make ends meet uh, a fortune, and instead of adding capacity, we in effect are now losing capacity. So we put in urgent requests to the governor's office uh, uh, to uh, work with the Texas Medical Board to open that back up. Uh, if you have adequate supplies and uh, 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 beds, which most of our hospitals do, the uh, we put together a letter uh, first went out with the three doctors plus our chair of health uh, we now uh, after a conversation last night with all 31 members of the senate and the lieutenant governor we're adding all the 31 members names to it and, and kicking it up quite a bit uh, as of this morning so i'm hoping that the uh, governor will um, take that into account and let us start uh, treating people that need to be treated. I'm not talking about cosmetic surgery. I'm just talking about things that really need to be done. So that's going to be very important to your hospitals. Um, the a lot of that was created by the Texas Medical Board. They just had put a great fear into a lot of the surgeons and threatened them to pull their license and stuff like that if they um, cross the line without actually saying where the line is. Uh, second thing is the uh, prison system. Uh, we've got about 10 prisons in Senate District 3. Um, you're in a close quarters when you're in a prison. So if somebody gets it, it's easy to spread. Uh, we had conference calls about a week ago uh, on this issue. Uh, may not affect you directly there in Nacogdoches, but I assure you the Correctional officers work in a lot of different surrounding counties. And uh, like the Beto unit over in Palestine a week ago had six uh, confirmed cases. It then went to 42. Then it went to 73 on Friday, last Friday. I don't know what it is today. I didn't look. But there's a 
fear that it's going to spread through the prison systems. I think the TDCJ is doing everything they can to isolate and quarantine the correctional officers uh, that have been exposed. Uh, the state, as well as the feds and the local hospitals, have been working to get our PPE inventories up. I think they're doing a good job. Ventilators and things like that, getting them on, getting them ready. But like I said, the hospitals aren't exactly covered up in COVID patients. Mm -hmm. So in effect, we've delayed uh, important uh, care and uh, because of some of those shortages. But now I think it's okay. Texas Workforce Commission is way behind. We told them a month ago, our office did, that they better gear up because they're fixing to get hit with a tsunami wave of applications. They assured us they were geared up, and then when the wave hit, their systems crashed, and they can't even begin to process all uh, the, uh, the the applications. So in trying to build that up, I know that there's a, they're hiring people like crazy, training them like crazy. I know uh, our Senate staffers from all around the state, we've got about 185 that are now trained, ready to go. Uh, Travis may say something about it. I, I think a lot of the House members have staff as well. They're going to be doing the same thing. And beginning today, I think the staff, extra staff, will start processing several hundred thousand applications that are missing some small pieces of information uh, that maybe we can help work them that. Very important for these people that uh, live from paycheck to paycheck when all of a sudden they don't have one for two or three weeks, uh, everything really backs up. So that is a pretty high priority as well. The second, uh, the, set, the federal sent small business administration loans that are forgiveness loans have become grants uh, that uh, if you keep your employees on the payroll for the next couple of months, uh, the loan will not only pay for the payroll, uh, but also pay for your rent and utilities is a great program. It's one of the better ones, I think. Uh, it's a much more efficient way to keep people's crews together instead of re uh, relying on uh, welfare, not welfare checks, but unemployment checks. And so those loans, a lot of people have applied for them. Uh, it's supposed to be all the red tape cut, but sure enough, but like all federal programs, there's a lot of red tape. But they pretty much worked through it, I know, and working with some of our local banks that have their own systems in East Texas, that those SBA loans have now been approved by the feds, and they're beginning to release the funds as of this week. So that, that's great. Uh, the governor announced yesterday that he will be having a press conference next week. I don't know why you have a press conference talking about the next press conference, but that's what he did on uh, the steps into beginning to open up the economy. So there'll be a lot of people uh, listening to what he says. Um, so that's the, uh, the beginning of uh, a different direction. And that's pretty much all I've got to report, unless somebody has a question they'd like to ask me. Thank you, Senator Nichols. Any questions for Senator Nichols? If not, thank you very much, Senator. We appreciate uh, all of that information helpful to us. Representative Clardy. All right. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, good to talk to you this morning, Senator Nichols. Thank you for that update. You covered a lot of ground, so I don't have to, to cover those issues. Um, and uh, Sherry Morgan, great job on your presentation. Uh, if I heard you correctly, what you're asking me to do is keep talking and stand tall. So I can do both of those things. I, I'm pretty committed to talking all the time and standing tall. So thank you for that. And I hope you all had the opportunity for those of you that are that are viewing this. I had my grandson Jackson on my lap a little while ago. So uh, I know this has been a difficult time for all of us in a lot of different ways, but it's also been a great time for families to get together. We have all the kids here. My mother's here. So it, it's it's been fun kind of reconnecting, you know, in a time other than Thanksgiving and Christmas. So uh, this has been uh, there's, there's some uh, silver linings to this, which I hope the cloud is dissipating. Uh, yesterday, uh, I took a trip over. I had gotten a call from one of the hospitals uh, and actually wanted to be work with them in Austin uh, with the tenant group about a concern with the testing center and uh, availability of, of, uh, of uh, 
testing materials. So I drove through the uh, testing site at the uh, the uh, DeWitt School of Nursing uh, north of town, the uh, SFA School of Nursing, and it's being operated uh, jointly by Nacogdoches Memorial and Nacogdoches Medical. Uh, talk to the, the staff there. Uh, they are low on testing supplies, but have sufficient supplies. They just received a STAR, uh, uh, which is a, the state sponsored program, uh, uh, the shipment of supplies. So they have a few days worth of testing materials. They continue to test on average somewhere 25, 30 tests a day. Uh, the one thing they told me, and I'll be following up today, is that there's a, 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 an Abbott. Uh, not the governor Abbott, but the company Abbott uh, uh, laboratory testing um, uh, machine or, or uh, equipment that we have available locally, four of them at medical center. Uh, we use to test all sorts of viral infections, including flu, and, and uh, there are cartridges that are coming out that will, instead of just, we've heard a lot about the prick, the, 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 the stick test where you do the blood and they can analyze that. That's a relatively uh, low reliability, it's useful, but it kind of indicates you ought to have a more significant test. The cartridge uh, actually does a more, uh, a more, it's more analytical and will provide you in detail whether you are positive for or have the antibodies for the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And so we have the machines to test them, but we just don't have the cartridges. Those have been directed uh, federally to the hotspots uh, and to the cities. Uh, but I'm going to see if we can make those available. But I think it's important to realize that one of the reasons our numbers have tripped up, I think, in the East Texas area, particularly in Nacogdoches, uh, Shelby County, St. Augustine County, I think is because of the access to more testing, whether it's the Department of Health in uh, Lufkin or here in uh, Nacogdoches. The, the cases are identified by the community residents of the person giving the test. So you know, we do have a significant number of cases here. Uh, but, uh, you know, a relatively low number that are hospitalized, although we have suffered four fatalities, but as we all know, I think uh, each of those cases, from what we understand, and there's HIPAA privacy issues, uh, I think all of those cases involve other factors, comorbidities, which you know, would lead to, uh, often lead to the fatality figure going up. So, um, you know, it's a, we, I think if you go back in time two weeks ago, uh, somebody correct me, but I think we were at one case a few weeks ago, maybe two, in Nacogdoches County. We're at 50 uh, with four fatalities. Um, I do think that we are starting to level off. Uh, we're going to see another few couple of weeks of uh, high intensity of the testing, uh, but we're just going to have to ride that through and do what we do what we need to do, and everybody continue to follow the safety procedures. We all have heard ad nauseum, uh, which apparently we're all doing. By the way, I do want to make one plug here on our call. I'm disappointed, you know, Sherry made a good point that we need to keep talking to each other, but a whole bunch of you have chosen not to enable your cameras on your devices. And that's kind of, for those of us that I can see Mary Magniac, I can see Darla, I see Kelly, I see Roy, uh, I see Wayne, you know, I see a handful of you, let, yeah, Les, let's see, Les Lineberger down there. But uh, a bunch of you people are kind of cheating us of, of the opportunity to see your smiling faces in the morning. And if we can put on clothes and brush a little makeup on or whatever we have to do to make ourselves presentable, well, the rest of you can too. Let's see a show of hands that thinks everybody ought to be on the television where we can see everybody. All right. I think it's unanimous. All right. So let's, let's all make an effort to, 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 to put, because it is good to see these faces. We don't get to see each other enough now. And I think it's important that we do, do this. So uh, y'all, y'all get enable your camera so we can all pick on each other. Um, so with that, the one last thing I want to add, uh, there is going to be a conference today, uh, a, a virtual conference of the Texas Railroad Commission. The other issue that's not getting much airplay, certainly nationally, but really not being covered, I think, appropriately uh, statewide, is the issue with the precipitous drop of the price of oil and, and uh, gas uh, and the effect that's going to have uh, short term, but also long term on the Texas economy, and particularly in that session, we go back and work on our budget. Uh, I don't think anybody six months ago was predicting that we would be seeing $20 barrels or be seeing gas at the pump for $1.50 a gallon. Uh, that is a good thing in some ways, and probably right now from a consumer standpoint, it's good that prices are low. But from a long-term revenue to the state uh, and the loss of those severance taxes and the closing and the, the, the really shutting down of any additional drilling activity, uh, that's going to have a, a long-term effect on us. What the Railroad Commission is meeting on today, and they're taking testimony, several producers have requested this. 
I think the larger volume of producers and, and uh, uh, energy companies are opposed to this, but there's discussion of what's called pro-rationing. And very short history, if you go back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the entity that really set the price of oil around the world was the Texas Railroad Commission. That changed with the formation of OPEC, and since it's been more commoditized and handled by the, the, the markets, uh, but they are looking at, at having the state, uh, a state of Texas through the Railroad Commission, which are oil and gas production, to uh, set the amount of oil and gas which can be produced. Basically, we have a, a government controlled um, of, of the market volume. And uh, the idea there, obviously, you shrink supply. Um, the United States now produces about 15% of the world's energy. And of that, Texas produces about half of that compared to relative to the other states. So we we are in a unique place to uh, have an effect here with with the, uh, the state of Texas, and hopefully can drive the the, the price back up. But it's a it's a very uh, uh, contentious issue for a lot of reasons, and so I'm tracking that pretty closely. But that's something we ought to all ought to be watching as Texans. Uh, and see how that issue comes out. So that's uh, going to happen today. I think there's no decisions made today. It was be information and the pros and cons of pro-rationing, and we'll see. Thank you. That. Just want to thank everybody uh, for getting on here. Encourage everybody to trigger their cameras and answer any questions that y'all may have. I got yours and Mary Joe's emails before Kathy's. Yeah. Thank you very much, Representative Klein. We really appreciate the very thorough report as well. Uh, and also the plug for uh, folks uh, activating their cameras. Uh, I know I uh, don't enjoy the two hours in makeup in the morning, but uh, it's uh, it, 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 at least you get to see my, my face. So there you go. Uh, we're also pleased to have with us the president and CEO of the Nacogdoches Economic Development Corporation, Larissa, and Larissa, I believe we're able to share your screen. So uh, Barbara's going to activate it right yeah. now. Okay, awesome. I'll get to when, when we get to that point, I'll, I'll activate it. I just have a few slides that I wanted to share with y'all today. Um, Claire, um, great. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. We've got Wayne's screen. Yeah, is that her talking? Why? I'm talking, but we can just see Wayne's screen right now. That's okay. I'm going to talk while y'all do that. Um, I first wanted to say um, hello to Council Member Bolden. I miss you. We haven't been able to see you at a council meeting um, for a while now. So glad to see you on here. Um, the um, just diving into things. Um, unemployment. I think I talked about that last time is between six and a half and seven percent um depending on how you look at it um that is doubling the percentage point rate that it was at last time now that is not doubling the actual number of unemployed people um but it did it is somewhere between six and a half and seven percent um keep in mind that that that's a lagging indicator so that's um, the numbers from march and if you think back to when this all started Yes, we were aware of it, but really things didn't start to, to really shut down until about March 15th. So that's about two weeks of this. Um, so we expect April's numbers to be significantly higher, um, probably about 15%. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Um, on the other hand, sales tax was up. Um, and now this is also a lagging indicator. This is February's number. Um, so I know that the city and the hospital district are just glad to be able to have that cash to utilize because we do expect the next number will be significantly down. Um, some things to talk about today, um, and if I can get my screen to share. Okay, that's okay. Um, there are in, the, the manpower, in the manpower presentation, um, they talked about let's let's get ready for this this new normal um i know that we're all a little impatient to be able to get back to work and to get back to doing things the way we used to um, and unless we're careful we're going to see a second wave um we probably will see a second wave anyway i think that's what the epidemiologists are saying but let's let's see how we can get back to work and maybe have a smaller second wave um so um just keep in mind um Try to plan those things for your workforce. How can you reduce that problem? Um, how can your workers work three to six feet apart? Um, 
How can, you know, nobody can buy masks. Do you have somebody in your shop that makes masks? Um, mm. Can you co-op with other businesses for some sterilization supplies and equipment? I know here at City Hall, they've got a real neat machine that they can use that goes in and can fog rooms. Um, so if we have a big, if we have to meet in a conference room, um, after the meeting, they go in and they fog the conference room and it decontaminates it, essentially. Um, can you work with one of your, your other businesses and, and maybe utilize one of those machines and share it between you? Um, some environmental safety things. Um, this sounds crazy, but if we're going to get going, we got to kind of start thinking, thinking the crazy steps. Um, are you prepared to maybe take some temperatures um, for, your, for your employees to get back to work? Um, can you change your shift schedule so that there's fewer people in your building at any given time? Can you maybe run a night shift or run an evening shift when you haven't done that before? Um, and again, as I said last week, all of these are so that you and your employees and your business can live to find another day. It may sound extreme, but I would rather you spend a couple bucks on a thermometer and take some temperatures than have an outbreak in a business and have your entire operation shut down um, for months and months. So um, moving on into the, the high unemployment number, you know, we for the last year or two years now have been blessed with record unemployment lows. And now that has flipped essentially overnight. So we have to flip back into that, that high unemployment thinking. Um, as far as employers go, you know, just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about how do we recruit more employees to East Texas to work these jobs. Um, and now we kind of have to flip that on its head. Um, so first, let's think about opportunities. Um, yeah. If you are a lucky one that has open jobs, keep in mind that there are a lot of people on the employment market now that maybe haven't been that are not maybe your traditional employees. Um, there was a slide that I was hoping to be able to share with y'all that talks about how restaurant workers can transition into other jobs. Um, think about skill sets that are translatable from one area of the economy to another. Um, and I'll share, the, I'll email those out so that y'all can see those slides. Um, also retention. This is something interesting to think about. We've got a really great unemployment insurance package right now. Um, between the state and federal government. Um, and that comes out to roughly 20 something dollars an hour if, if you combine the state and federal benefit. Your job, if you've got open jobs as an employer, is to recruit people to come to work from you rather than to collect that unemployment benefit. It sounds crazy, but it, it is a natural problem. Um, and so if let's say that you typically pay $14 an hour, how are you gonna fill that gap? How are you going to fill that that um, pay to get people to come to work for you rather than to collect unemployment? Um, increasing pay, that's obvious, um, but pretty hard to do right now. Um, something that I know Pilgrim's Pride does is they um, have a completion bonus. So if you work for three months, then you get a bonus. Um, um, you know, for maybe every three months that you work, you get an additional bonus. Um, other than pay, um, stability is, is nice if you can show um, your, if you can make your employees feel like it is a stable place to work, um, that is helpful. Compensation and benefits, you know, the whole reason why employers offer health insurance is because after World War II, employers were trying to attract employees to their place of business. They couldn't raise their pay enough, so they said, we're going to start offering health insurance. And so look at your compensation and benefit packages. Is there a way you can change that? And then also flexibility. That is something that is rising to the top of the list of what employees are looking for in jobs these days. Sometimes it even moves past um, compensation. Sometimes people are looking for flexibility and they'll take a job that's more flexible over one that pays more. Um, and especially right now when we're faced with people whose kids aren't in school, um, who may have to, to work alternate shifts and things like that, they're looking for flexibility in their workplace. Um, and then my last little PSA, um, thank a banker. You know, we like to make jokes about lawyers and bankers, but the ones that I know worked 15 hour days for the last two weeks. Um, and so they are pouring money into our economy. I know that, the, that that system is a little bogged down right now, but I do know for a fact that we've had a couple of those loans funded. 
Um, so if you see a banker, thank them for their hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa. And uh, I want to let you folks know that there, uh, there are several companies offering services for sanitizing and disinfectant listed on the Chamber uh, Facebook page and website. So please visit their, uh, uh, those products are still available and uh, we've had them contact us and ask for uh, uh, asking us to list them. So please, please take time to visit those, uh, the, the website for those types of resources. Uh, I'm also pleased to welcome the president of, uh, of Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, would you please welcome uh, President Scott Gordon, Dr. Gordon, good morning. Well, good morning, and uh, just a few notes here. Uh, this past Friday, we began refunds to our students, and and again, I mentioned at the, the last uh, um, video conference, about nine million dollars we're refunding to our students for a variety of of areas, such as uh, um, residence halls, uh, meal plans, some of the uh, student fees. And so those that began Friday and will continue here for for a bit. Um, we did see a um, a surge, I would call it, in summer enrollment, and so um, we uh, were excited about that. Uh, maybe it's the refunds that had students uh, thinking about registering for summer classes, but uh, we're going to be continuing to really uh, push hard for. Uh, summer enrollments and also going into um, the fall and uh, this is a what we call a base year so uh, our credit hours generated will be utilized at the state level for uh, funding decisions so we're really making a, a push and the COVID-19 obviously has impacted universities from across the uh, the, uh, this, the nation really. Um, we also um, continue to expand our work with uh, the community around the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, you heard last week about some of the partnerships we developed. Um, this week, we uh, um, I made a connection with a, a national firm down in Houston and our physics and engineering faculty. Um, they're looking at a new methodology for disinfection, um, utilizing uh, far UV LED 220 nanometer um, light, and uh, it looks to be a, a very promising, so um, they'll be working uh, very, very hard on that. Um, we also, um, as, as many of you know, um, early May is usually a big time in the community for commencement, and a lot of people are coming into, um, into town, and we had to uh, postpone commencement. Um, we will be having on May 30th a virtual commencement um, where we will essentially be replicating the, as best we can, the traditional commencement. Um, also, any student who uh, is, was scheduled to graduate this May will be allowed to participate in a in-person commencement when, when it is safe to do so. But uh, that uh, virtual commencement will, um, will occur on the 30th and uh, we have speakers lined up and we're going to go through the, uh, the entire ceremony for, for our graduates. So that's, uh, that's it from my end. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gordon. We really appreciate that update, and uh, we'll certainly get the commencement, uh, uh, the virtual commencement on our radar screen here at the chamber, and I'm confident our colleagues on the call will as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, representing the social services, would you please welcome with me the uh, president and CEO of the Nacogdoches Area United Way, Gary Lee Ashcraft. Hi, everybody. I'll go fast. Um... Uh, one new twist, uh, first off, the agency leaders are working uh, tirelessly to uh, serve. Uh, several of them are on this call today. Uh, a new twist is uh, from ADAC, Alcohol, Drug, and Prevention Council. Uh, for those of you out there that are listening that serve kids uh, food or work with kids, uh, children, uh, that organization has a plethora of uh, prevention activity books that have uh, uh, some creative things to do and what have you uh, for your kids. Uh, if you're able to write, uh, I'm not, uh, the number is 
569-1445. The second and final thing I'll uh, report out is that we now have a working uh, uh, COVID-19 fund donate button on our website. Uh, Thanks to Caroline and Kenny Rena, uh, Caroline Garner. Uh, The uh, site is operating uh, and already receiving uh, donations. Uh, We uh, uh, expect this week to near $25,000 in that fund. uh, uh, Thanks to a company called Encore, who's made a nice or is making a nice donation to uh, our COVID fund. Uh, I've got a couple of requests, uh, grant requests that can give us some real boost if we are able or successful uh, to uh, receive those uh, grants. Um, I want to tell you also, we're in a t-shirt sales business. Uh, The Break Not Bend thing is on, uh, uh, brand I guess I should say, is on our website. They're good looking t-shirts and it'll help our United Way. Uh, you're a United Way that needs a little help as well. So that's the end of my report. Thank you very much, and thanks for all y'all do. Thank you very, uh, Gary Lee, and thank you for all you and uh, Caroline and and uh, and your volunteer leadership is doing for for uh, for Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches County. We very much appreciate it. The next person on the agenda is Larry Kane from Angelina College Small Business Development Center. Larry's been my go-to guy for all of the uh, detailed questions as it relates to all things finance, and uh, we're blessed to have him here uh, serving Nacogdoches County. Larry? Thank you, Ryan, and good morning to everybody. Uh, Based on the number of my phone calls uh, since last Friday, I think people are getting the hang of the PPP program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. So I'm not going to go over those details today. Uh, People are welcome to contact me if you're having issues with those. I'd be glad to help. Um, I've had a lot of clients call me. They were concerned because they haven't heard anything from the SBA, even though they applied for their idle loan back uh, on uh, March 30th or before. That's two weeks ago. And I'll tell you, two weeks ago today, I emailed the disaster customer service email address with a specific couple of questions, and I had not received an answer until yesterday, and I got a call from an SBA rep in Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't take the call the first time because I thought he was trying to sell me a vehicle warranty, so I didn't take it. But the next time I did, and I'm fortunate that I was able to talk to somebody directly with the SBA and get some answers. Uh, One thing he told me is if you apply to an idle loan and the number that you got once you submitted your application, if that number begins with a two, you need to reapply for the idle loan application process so you can be considered for the up to $10,000 emergency grant. So if your application number starts with a two, you need to reapply, go through that process again. And if this starts with anything else, you're fine, and hopefully you will hear something this week. On the PPP program, I talked to a couple of local bankers yesterday, and it sounds like they're getting their processes in order, and they're processing loans and even funded a few at this point. Remember, there's still paperwork to be done and documents to be signed and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the banks told me that they processed over 500 loans, totaling about $180 million uh, bank-wide. And another one had done over 400 loans, totaling about $75 million. So if you work out those numbers, the average loan is probably $200,000 or more. And, of course, a lot of them are a lot smaller than that. But uh, uh, those loans are being processed. And uh, it looks to me like about two-thirds of that original $349 billion that was is already allotted. So if you have not applied for your PPP loan and you're eligible to apply, I recommend you get in that pipeline today. You contact your local bank you do business with and apply that way. If your bank doesn't participate in the program or if they've cut off accepting applications, uh, you may have heard yesterday the governor's announcement of the $50 million PPP 
uh, loan allocation done through Goldman Sachs and Lyft Fund. Lyft Fund is a non-bank lender. You can go to their website and uh, apply for that loan through them if your bank is not taking applications. I expect that $50 million will go in a matter of days, so don't hesitate. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that come up. This Friday morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be doing a Facebook Live for the Lufkin Chamber. And I don't say that to get you to watch. I say that because I need some ideas. I need some material. It looks like the SVDCs are going to receive some federal funds. We don't know when. We don't know how much. But those funds will be used for the recovery phase uh, after this disaster is over. So I'm supposed to put a plan together, and I need some uh, somebody to look down the road three to six months and tell me what small businesses in our area are going to need. I lost my crystal ball. I can't find it, and I'm not very good at forecasting, so I really need some input from local business leaders and chambers. Uh, send me some ideas about what we could do uh, once we get into that phase. If anybody has any questions, call our office number, 936-633-5400. And those phones are forwarded to my cell number, and I'll be glad to help uh, any way we can. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much, Larry. And uh, again, we'll publish that number uh, 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 for everybody uh, at the conclusion of the call. I see Kelly's on the line, and if she'd be kind enough to do that, that would be great uh, to, to post it on the website as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Larry. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome, would you please welcome the uh, Communications Director for the City of Nacogdoches uh, that has done a marvelous job. Uh, she and Anna have done a wonderful job in keeping us posted on the latest statistics as it relates to, to Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches County. Would you welcome Dr. Amy Mahaffey, please? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Representative Clardy requested I turn my camera back on, so I have followed instructions, which never happened, so make a note now that I followed directions from somebody. Um, but no, I appreciate y'all being on today and continuing to keep yourselves informed about the community. It is um, really a partnership from all of the local hospitals, um, SFA, the city, the county, and um, you know, of course, help from the state. And so we are um, very blessed to live in a very giving community. And I know that y'all heard me say this before, but it is just something to be really proud of because um, you never really know where what you're made of until you're tested. And I think that um, watching Nacogdoches respond to this um, disaster is is a really great thing. Um, I have, you know, we've we've talked quite a bit about numbers and statistics and so I won't bore you with um, wash your hands, be responsible for your actions, that kind of thing because I think everyone on this call knows that by now. Um, but I do think that um, it's important to kind of know how your community is at work for you. Um, you read the newspaper and you hear the news and um, sometimes that's um, a way to get the daily information but what you don't always see is the information that's coming from uh the the, the background and kind of peeling the curtain back um it's it's a really great thing we have a um an emergency operations center that is very active we meet every 48 hours and they um, try to project needs and so um, what that means is the county and the city operate under one um, kind of response team um, part of that team and part of that team um, as uh, Wayne mentioned Anna Middlebrooks part of that team in terms of uh, the working with nonprofit organizations, we have um, a logistics team. There's a huge arm of planning and looking ahead at this disaster and projecting um, a week, two weeks, three weeks, and even months in advance to project needs. Um, part of that group is obviously the hospitals because unlike a hurricane or um, flooding or any other disaster that we may be used to, um, we we have a very slow moving, slowly evolving situation that is, is largely healthcare oriented. And so while we can declare a disaster and issue stay home, stay safe orders and things like that from the municipality side, we really are here to support the wonderful work of our local hospitals and our local healthcare um, workers. And so with that being said, um, it's just really important to keep yourself informed. Uh, we 
encourage you and I want to empower everybody here. I know you've heard me say this a thousand times to go and tell your friends and your network and people who may work for you uh, what to do if they have a question about the stay home, stay safe order. That's a city line. Um, we have a city call center and you can call in a question and you can send an email. I'll add all of that info in the chat when we're done. Um, what to do if you have, if you're feeling ill, we have a call center for that that's um, staffed at SFA that um, is manned by volunteers and they've done a wonderful job of, of screening patients and screening the correct people to get tests. Um, there is a lot of questions about you know, I, I run a nonprofit and I have a need. For example, our um, local food bank did six times the amount of business they normally do um, last week. And so we've worked with, with them to try to find them a new home to, to facilitate the logistics that they need. They have all of the volunteers that they need, but they needed kind of a different setup in terms of real estate and a place to send people and a way to filter people through. And so the team that's um, at the, the city and the county um, works on all of that and everything in between. Um, we are going to continue to send out information as a, as a, a unified command. Um, the, the important thing and really what my role is, is rumor control. So, well, I heard so-and-so went to this event and spread it to 50,000 people in town. And I heard that so-and-so's brother talk to so-and-so sister y'all know how it is in a small town and so it's just really important that we continue to be leaders in this community and help with those rumors and to help people if you don't know the answer hey go to the city go to the county and ask the question um it's always great we we are here to answer those questions so if you have a, a, a you hear something that you may be concerned about that's perfectly legitimate and we would rather you call us or email us or reach out than tell all of your friends and so not that anybody here would do that but that is a message that would needs to probably you need to be empowered to tell the people that you work with that it's it's okay to um to ask questions and to be concerned and you have people here that are here to explain to you um the way that all of this works the main question I've gotten since I spoke to you last week is how to report recoveries. You know, you're sharing all the bad news about how many um, people are, are, are infected, but wh where are the recoveries? Who's recovered? And there is a complex formula to do that. Um, and we're going to work on getting that information. And I think an important caveat here is to realize that there is um, a s oversimplification of the numbers that we send out. And that's not to be that's not to not be transparent it's to give information in a digestible format that's easy to read um, what we are also working on now that we have an influx of cases um, is a um, a dashboard that you can look at and look at a, the numbers and kind of a the data at a glance we've gotten to the point where we have um, active cases in the double digits and there needs to be a quicker way to look at the information because us sending a um, a, a status card that you've all received that says this is how many new cases we have um, isn't telling the true picture and the whole story of the community. That being said, even the dashboard isn't perfect. Um, as soon as the numbers are released, they're out of date. As soon as I give you a number on the phone call right now, they're out of date because of the evolving nature of this event. And so um, it's important to kind of take everything you read as, as trustworthy information, but also with a grain of salt saying, um, well, the city of blah, blah, blah has all of this other information. Why can't you do that? Sometimes it's apples and oranges and there are a lot of circumstances um, that prevent us from doing that, including the fact that we don't have our own health department that's devoted to Nacogdoches County. Um, we've been asked about the, what is perceived as an influx of cases. Um, when you see the news and you see um, the number of cases in contiguous counties around us, and then you see Nacogdoches County, we appear to be high. Um, there's been some analysis done on the um, number of cases per capita and based on our population with the health services and the population that they have. And we are actually right where we're expected to be. And so we are testing quite a bit. Um, we do have, um, a, a really active testing center. We have two hospitals that are a hub for other communities. And although we don't report cases from other counties, um, it is plausible to um, assume that we have an influx of population from contiguous counties in our community day to day. And so the people in Nacogdoches may be at a higher risk. Um, if you also think of it, um, 
Nacogdoches kind of functions as a microcosm of, of a urban area. And so if you think about the industry, you think about the diverse population, you think about um, the types of jobs people are doing, we have a university, we have lots of variance in the way that our community looks, um, it's not surprising that we may have numbers. Um, the, the nature of a pandemic is that a large proportion, over half of our population will have this virus at some point. And so as you've heard, flattening the curve is a very real thing because our hospital not only serves Nacogdoches residents, but it serves residents from around the region. And so um, flattening the curve and ensuring that our hospitals have a chance of ensuring that they don't have an influx of, of critical patients is, is really, really important. Um, the community um, is, has done a good job and we want to continue to encourage people to follow the stay home orders. And um, there's been a few questions about if it's being enforced. They've seen some busyness and um, I, I would I would assume that there's been some uh, quite a few unnecessary trips in Nacogdoches based on the busyness of Lowe's parking lot that I saw over the weekend driving by. Um, but that doesn't mean really anything. It means that, you know, you may have um, people that have essential business that they're conducting. And so, well, although we are enforcing, we don't know about a problem unless we hear about it. We encourage people to go to that um, call center or the website. I'll add it again, the city-based website, um, to, to report things like that. Um, we had a few places over the weekend that were reported to me, and I was able to call them in in that way, um, and they were able to go out and enforce compliance. And so there is a lot of um, enforcement taking place. Um, it may just not be, you're not going to see um, Nacogdoches police, you know, raiding Walmart, I guess, is a, is a silly example, but that is, that is um, there is a lot of um, work being done on that front. And so um, I can answer any questions. I know we've got a lot of reports today. Um, I'm not nearly as much fun as selling t-shirts like Gary Lee, but nobody ever accused me of being more fun than Gary Lee Ashcraft anyway, so it's okay. Um, but I am happy to stick around and answer questions in the chat and I will add the email information for everybody. Um, one last thing, I always um, encourage folks if you want to be added to the email list when we do announce active cases um, and you're not getting those emails and you'd like to be on that list to distribute them to your network, um, I encourage you to send that information on. Add your email address in the chat and we'll get you added to the list. So thanks for tuning in guys. Thank you very much, Amy. I really appreciate that. And I would respectfully uh, uh, endorse uh, Amy's last appeal. If you want up-to-date information, I mean, both on Saturday and Sunday, I received updated statistics and numbers. It's, it's, a, it's a really good resource. I would uh, respectfully suggest you get your email to, to Amy or to Anna, and uh, they'll get you folks plugged in on that. Uh, for the purpose of an update from the Nacogdoches Independent uh, School District, would you welcome the Communications Director, Les Kleinberger, please? Thanks, Wayne. Curbside pickup of student meals is going through a change beginning today. Pickup will now take place twice a week with multiple meals provided for students. Pickup this week is set for Tuesday and Thursday before going to Mondays and Wednesdays beginning next week. Sites are located at Brooks Quinn Jones Elementary, Fredonia Elementary, Mike Moses Middle School, McMichael Middle School, and the NISD Central Kitchen located on Hughes Street. Limited instruction continues, either through online access or the distribution of paper instructional packets. Last week, the district announced how work can be returned to teachers, either through email or by physically dropping off paper packets at school. The latter process includes packets being left untouched before school personnel begin the sorting process, and a similar process is followed when leaving the packets for parent and student pickup. The district's grading policy will be adjusted for the spring semester. NISD's teaching and learning department is putting the final touches on the changes. We don't want to penalize students for everything that's taken place. Dr. Gabriel Trujillo officially started last week as superintendent of schools. As you might expect, the current COVID-19 crisis is his focus, not only ensuring some amount of instruction is taking place, but that first and foremost, the safety of students and staff and their families is taken care of. And then finally, uh, upcoming events. We haven't rescheduled any events that are planned for the coming weeks, 
although it is clear things such as graduation will be affected. For now, we're waiting to see if and when students will return to class, something Governor Abbott has said he will address this week. Wayne, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Les, I appreciate that. And while we've been on this conference call, I did receive notification that, and we'll post this on the Chamber's website, that the governor will have a small business webinar uh, tomorrow at, uh, at 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, and you have to register online. It's an online seminar, obviously. Uh, I did want to let you folks uh, know about that. And uh, I do believe we have the governor's representative, Betty Rousseau, on the line. Betty, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have anything to add uh, from the governor's office? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Wayne. I appreciate it. Uh, if you go to our website and see coronavirus, under that, you'll see learn more. Click on that. There's an FAQ sheet that's updated daily on there with uh, a lot of good questions and answers on there that have come through. Our website is gov.business.gov backslash business. Uh, and that's the main thing. And just to keep keep uh, you keep it in mind that I'm here to help you in any way and I can give you my phone number it's 281-222-6814 just let me know if there's anything I can do to help you I'm, I'm here to help you in any way thank you thank you very much Betty and it's great to have you on this phone call uh, as well we'll post that information at contact information on the chamber's website i remind you that we do record this phone call uh, and it will be on the chamber's website later today uh, and uh, we've had several people especially members of the media indicate that they've visited it uh, that we're not able to get on on the call during the course of the day any questions of any of our presenters today Wayne, I don't have a question. This is Claire, but I did just want to say um, the information that Larissa shared from the Manpower webinar that was last week, uh, she said she was going to post the um, or, or send out the uh, slides if you're interested in it. Um, also, if you're interested in listening to the entire webinar, um, just email me at claire.robbins at manpower.com and I can send you the link to listen to that particular webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. For those of you that don't know, Claire is the chair of the board of directors for the uh, Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce and has been a, a, a blessed resource for, for us here as we've navigated these uh, uh, interesting waters, I guess is the best way of saying it. Any other questions or comments from anybody that uh, would like to add? Hey, this is uh, Tim Monzingo from the Daily Sentinel there. I had a question I kind of wanted to direct towards Larissa. Um, uh, uh, have we heard of any businesses in the area that, is, that have closed as a result of this that don't plan to reopen? Um, or, or have they made any announcements to that effect to y'all? I've heard some people kind of talk about that in a roundabout way and that they've heard that, uh, but haven't seen anything official. And I wanted to know if that was on y'all's radar or anything like that. Tim, we are constantly in contact with businesses, um, making calls to them every day, just kind of feeling pulse and seeing who needs help and, and how we can help. Um, I have not heard of any businesses officially stating that they are closing permanently due to due to this. Um, I do know two of our downtown businesses, um, Twigs and Tin and Gall's Cafe, um, are closing, but it's not due to COVID. Um, the owners um, received a job opportunity in another state. And so um, it was kind of a timing thing. The job opportunity came completely separately from COVID and, and you know, Ball's Cafe is a restaurant and they were, they had the doors closed anyway. So, um, but other than that, I have not heard anything official, um, which is good news. Any other questions, folks? Mm -hmm. 
If not, uh, first of all, I once again would like to thank our presenters today. You, you, you all just do a magnificent job in uh, in keeping the community and, and our, our members at the chamber and our community stakeholders informed. Uh, I can't I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule. I know all of us are doing things differently. Uh, I want to thank all of you. I also want to thank each and every one of you to take the time to tune in. Uh, we had about 63 today at peak period. Uh, participate on the call today. So uh, uh, great participation and we, we will see you a week from today. If any of you have suggestions for other presenters or people you'd like to hear from, we'll do our best to try to secure them. Uh, but uh, remember this, that uh, because of schedules and because of, uh, and because of restrictions, there are some that are just not available, but we'll do our best to secure the, the uh, presenters that you need to hear from. Uh, again, thank you very much, folks, and this concludes our call.